I heard about a very sad thing the other day. A man named John Steingard, lead singer for a Christian group, Hawk Nelson, has said he no longer believes in God. I'm going to quote some works that he wrote on his Instagram post that are not getting exposure in the media and respond to John's words. I've been praying a lot about this. Hi, I'm David Daniels from Chick Publications. John, I won't go into all the points you raised. Others can deal with those. There was one point that really grabbed my attention and my heart. You said, I was raised to believe that the Bible was the perfect word of God. Sure, it was written by human beings, but those people were divinely inspired. And we can consider the words they wrote to be the word of God. I began to have questions and doubts about that. It seemed like there were a lot of contradictions in the Bible that didn't make sense. I don't want to get too deep in the weeds here, so I'll leave the details for another time. Suffice it to say that when I began to believe that the Bible was simply a book written by people as flawed and imperfect as I am, that was when my belief in God truly began to unravel. I totally understand your point, John. Next, you said that you asked your father-in-law, a patient and sincere pastor who loves and believes in the Lord, about a Bible passage that bothered you. Your father-in-law replied by asking you if, quote, I had been reading the King James Version because he felt that King James had put his own spin on a lot of things, and that version couldn't fully be trusted. You have to go back to the original Greek, he said. This is something I've heard a lot over the years. I asked him, so it sounds like you believe the modern translations can't fully be trusted because they are human, flawed, and imperfect? I'm simply taking that thought to its next natural conclusion that the original Greek is also human, flawed, and imperfect, and also can't fully be trusted. He replied, well, if you believe that, what do you have left? I said, exactly. Then you concluded, once I found that I didn't believe The Bible was the perfect word of God. It didn't take long to realize that I was no longer sure he was there at all. That thought terrified me. It sent me into a tailspin. The implications of that idea were absolutely massive. John, you were right. If you don't believe that God's words in the Bible are perfect then what's the point in trying to understand a part of the Bible? Where's the value in understanding a flawed human document to shape your life by it? If you can't trust it, why bother? I've told people for years that when we don't believe in a perfect Bible, it leads to doubt, and doubt is like a landslide. Many have said to me when I was training to be a Bible translator and minister in Bible college in Fuller Seminary, it doesn't matter if a doctrine isn't in this or another verse. All that matters is it's in a verse somewhere else. That's not really true, John. Look at the way Lifeway and Barna and other surveys of people's beliefs in the Bible go. The people who read Doubting Bibles themselves have the exact same doubts as those that are found written into those Bibles. This all started in 1881. Most Bibles from that date switch from the King James reading because they decided to change the words using one or both of two Greek codices, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. Those Bibles remove words from verses that clearly define certain doctrines, who Jesus is, who the Godhead is, salvation 
by faith, not works. The existence of angels, devils, heaven, and hell, and the recording of Bible events as historical facts, not theological fancy. Well, those two big Greek books, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, are based upon writings written by Gnostic people who denied all those clear Bible doctrines. Those Gnostics rewrote and removed or changed what they didn't like. And lo and behold, all those changed words are what the critics put in the modern Bibles. Let me tell you something that I found out about the translators who made those changes into English in the 1870s. I own a thick book called While Men Slept, a biblical and historical account of the new universal Christianity by Kirby F. Fennon, dated 2002. You'll probably find the beliefs of those 1870s translators familiar. John, lots of modern professors say, the beliefs of modern translators don't influence the text they chose. Their beliefs don't enter into their work. It's just science. But Fannin answered the question. He wrote, Would there, the translators, denying the deity of Jesus Christ, denying the existence of heaven and hell, denying the complete atonement provided by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, as well as many other basic doctrines, have affected the way they selected various readings of Scripture? Did their personal beliefs really matter? One might ask the simple question. Did the Unitarian, Universalist, and Socialist views which they supported have any significant effect on the doctrines of the Bible? In other words, didn't they remove their theology from their work on textual criticism? You see, John, their theology greatly influenced what text they chose. In fact, the Greek texts they selected and translated matched their doubts and disbeliefs. And the church today has picked up those very same doubts as we find in modern polling data. Here's an example. Jesus is the truth, John 14, 6. But in John 7, 8, in many modern Bibles, Jesus lied. The King James says, I go not up yet. But in many modern Bibles say, I'm not going up. Two verses later, Jesus did go up. In the King James, in the vast testimony of historical documents, Jesus said, not yet. But in the Gnostic text, Bibles, Jesus said he wasn't going at all. He lied. A lying Jesus cannot be the truth. I have a book with 257 of these verses called Look What's Missing. It shows what's missing and why it matters. Now, I've got to tell you, John, your father-in-law was just repeating what he had been taught. Your Instagram text said he felt that King James had put his own spin on a lot of the things and that version couldn't fully be trusted. Remember, King James had nothing to do with the translation of the Bible that has now taken on his name. The 54 plus translators and editors did that work without his input. So, what couldn't fully be trusted about the King James? What doctrine is not written clearly, cleanly, and distinctly in the King James? It's the other Bibles that are missing elements of doctrines or contradict each other. Are the scholars saying that it's better to trust a Bible that contradicts itself instead of one that has consistent doctrines? The King James Bible has been tried, tested, and proved over 409 years. It brings the fruit of faith, not doubt. It stands the test of time so much that people polled who read it regularly are the main ones who stand with the classical doctrines of Christianity, their faith unwavered. That should tell you something. God said through Paul in Romans 10, 17, 
So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If it's not giving birth to faith in your heart, maybe you're not hearing the actual words of God. And John, it's not word of God as if it's just the ideas. It's the words of God as well. You're welcome to watch my hundreds of videos and see the evidence for yourself. On the second part, what he said to your father-in-law, John, you're also correct. You wrote this. I asked him, so it sounds like you believe that modern translator translations can't fully be trusted because they are human flawed and imperfect? I am simply taking that thought to its next natural conclusion, that the original Greek is also human, flawed, and imperfect, and also can't fully be trusted. You are right. If the modern translation cannot fully be trusted because of flawed people, then how do we know that the Greek writers were not also untrustworthy because of their flaws? Your thinking is consistent, John, but let's take it back one step further and then bring it all the way to the present. How do we know there's a consistent God at all? Thousands of people were there to witness what Jesus did and said. People wrote stories about him, and those stories got passed around. Eyewitnesses said, that's what happened. I was there. Of all the many records, only four of these survived the scrutiny of all those eyewitnesses, the ones written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those four Gospels tell about Jesus and what he said. Why should people take him seriously? He backed up his statements with miracles, that's why. Acts 2.22, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you, by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. That's what got Jesus in hot water, especially that he did these miracles in a way and at a time that the Jewish authorities said was against the law of Moses. Look at all the times Jesus got blamed for doing miracles on the Sabbath day. But his miracles validated his teaching, especially his coming back from the dead and ascending to heaven. All that history and teaching is recorded in the scriptures in thousands of copies in Greek alone, and translated into other languages of the day. Then there are the apostles and certain other disciples. People listened to them because of the miracles they performed. There were eyewitnesses, lots of them. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto this by them that heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will? 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Mark 16, 19 to 20. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. These apostles and other disciples taught doctrines that made sense and were consistent with all that God had already said in the Old Testament. God chose eight of those apostles and disciples to write scripture. Apostles, Matthew, John, Peter, and Paul, disciples Mark and Luke, and Jesus' half-brothers James and Jude. These writers of scripture testify to a consistent God by writing a consistent history, worldview, theology, and doctrine. Jesus made a promise that is stated in Matthew and repeated in Mark and Luke. Heaven and earth shall pass away, 
but my words shall not pass away. Matthew 24, 35, Mark 13, 31, Luke 21, 33. Not word, John. Words. My seminary professors totally missed that. So we have Jesus' promise that his words shall not pass away. And if Jesus is who he says he is, he is God. And he can make it happen. The printing of many different kinds of Bibles culminated in the King James Bible in 1611, then just called the Holy Bible. After that, there was no serious challenger to the King James until 1881. That already gave us 270 years of time for fruit inspecting. Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruits, Matthew 7, 16. The fruit of the King James Bible is faith, pure and simple. It brought about such clarity of doctrine and encouragement to works of faith that we experienced the biggest missionary movement in history and countless groups and movements were either founded or returned to their roots by reading and trusting its words. In 1881, the so-called modern Bibles were introduced based upon two questionable doctrines, uh, documents that matched Gnostic disbelief in the Bible. They were chosen and translated by doubters. They wrote that doubt into the text and transferred that doubt to the readers, as we can see all around us today. The fruit of the Bible since 1881 is doubt, corrosive, contagious, uncontrollable, doubt. We see it all around us. You are left with a clear choice, John. Faith or doubt. If you want to disbelieve, there are many scholars who will help you. If you're willing to believe, there's over 6,000 years of help and guidance and direction and fulfillment of prophecy and knowledge of future things later discovered by science and technology and you get the point. You can do as you choose, John. I don't know who brought you up in the faith, but it looks like they, as they did to your acquaintances, unintentionally planted the seeds of doubt in you. And you are not alone. You said it yourself. I have had many private conversations with trusted friends about my doubts and discovered to my absolute shock that they are shared by nearly every close friend my age who also grew up in the church. I am stunned by the number of people in visible positions within Christian circles that feel the same way as I do. You're right again, John. You are not unique, and that is not your fault. You and your friends were taught by people who are as deceived as I was by my well-meaning teachers. You see, those teachers had strong faith, like your father-in-law and probably your dad, but they never thought ahead about what those doubts they laid down would do to the next generation, like you and your friends. I wasn't raised Christian like you were, John but I tried to make up for it in Bible college. I got degrees in Bible, linguistics, and theology, but I found the same problems you did. Thankfully, I got challenged by a whole lot of Bible-believing materials. They showed me that I and my professors had been sold a false history of the Bible. If you're interested, I've written a bunch of books and, and made videos about it. I came to realize that God had indeed kept his promise to preserve his words, and that those words are preserved in the Hebrew Masoretic, the Greek Received Text, but more importantly for all history, they are preserved and accurately translated into fruit-bearing English in the King James Bible. Ask yourself, why would someone be upset if you trusted just one Bible and lived your life by it? Isn't that strange? If all Bibles are 99% the same, as my professors repeatedly said, why is the one tried, tested, and proved Bible somehow flawed? 
If God is real, and he is true, and he cares about truth, and he loves us, he would tell us what he wants. He would tell us what makes him happy. And he would tell us how we could be happy with him forever, if that were his plan. If God is real, he wouldn't hide away the truth in a desert monastery for 1,800 years. And then reveal a text that causes you to question the very faith-building doctrines that are clearly written in the Bible that's been available since the advent of printing. God would do what he said. He'd keep his promises. He would spread his words far and wide. And he would not give you an inconsistent, contradictory book. He would give you a book that reflected his nature. I hope you think about these things, John. And if you want to talk, I'm easily available at Chick Publications. John, may I say a word to mature Christians whose hearts are aching as mine over what happened to you? Brethren, you are solid in faith, likely mentored by people with the King James. It is a mistake to give contradictory Bibles to young believers and expect them to be as grounded as you. John's honest crisis of faith is the result. You'll be fine, but what about the next generation? We need to give them a Bible with clear doctrine that is consistent and brings a consistent faith and hope, not a mess of contradictions leaving it for them to sort out for themselves. God is not the author of confusion. God bless you, and have a wonderful day.